This one's going to be a first for the channel. This is low even for you! Well, it's not as gratifying to not be a contrarian for once. I simply cannot let this one slide. Hey, I'm ER. Little something about myself, I watch a lot of Chinese moving picture serials, yet I hate significantly more of them than I like. But there are three I can fanboy over as autistically as the worst of them. Avatar The Last Airbender, Death Note, and Steins Gate. Much to my disappointment, Avatar The Last Airbender received one of the worst live-action film adaptations of all time. Why are you smiling like that? Uh, oh, I was smiling? Ugh. Now, seven years later, much to my embittered expectations, Death Note has received one of the worst live-action film adaptations I have ever seen. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that we have to put a stop to this nonsense before they put the head of my Steins Gate on the slab next. <laughs> But we're here to talk specifically about Death Note 2017, the latest addition to a long, long line of Death Note media. No! <laughs> Development Hell was supposed to have kept it in permanent limbo, but no! They just had to get their act together long enough to spawn this fifth Death Note movie that the world so badly needed. Thanks so gosh darn much, Netflix. Fox. Now I'm not against adaptations as a concept. I like many of them, some even over their source material. What I am against is director Adam Wingard and screenwriter Jeremy Slater and their concept of what an adaptation should be. You know what, the idea of, of, of a remake, the idea of telling the same story seems crazy to me. For us it was always about like, let's, 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 Let's look at this in a new light. New light. New light. I understand some changes must be made, if only due to time constraints. But what percentage of the film must stay true to Death Note before it ceases to properly be Death Note? Can anything be Death Note so long as it says it is? Apparently it can, but not everybody has to be happy about it. Even if it were a one-to-one -one panel by panel remake, you'd still find reasons to hate it, you giant weeb. Well, good thing you can't catch me out on that. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? As a reimagining, Deathflix is inferior in every way to its source material. So what's wrong with me pointing that out? For this review, I'll be focusing primarily on the story and characters, as I am wont to do. And when all is said and done, if any of you can still confidently tell me that Deathflix was okay, well. Spoilers ahead for the movie, but not too many for the manga or anime, generally. What? Oh god. What the fuck is this? No! Stop this! Okay, there's taking it in a new direction. And then there's driving straight off a cliff. He's going over that cliff! <laughs> Let's listen to the music that opened the Death Note anime. Now let's listen to the music that opened the Japanese Death Note live-action movie. These two openings are quite a bit alike, aren't they? They're both dark, figuratively and literally speaking, they're both a bit spooky, and both use grim and atmospheric music, all to set a tone. In contrast, Deathflix begins its movie with the brightest overcast day ever. Okay, that would be forgivable, if it weren't accompanied by a fucking 1980s soft rock tune. That just screams Death Note to you, doesn't it? I totally expect a story about hundreds of people being systematically murdered with a magic notebook from this. All right, all right, we're only three seconds into this thing. I need to fucking relax. So we have our establishing shot that tells us we're in Seattle. Then we're at a school. Then a 
train yard? Back at school. What? And back at school again. Some odd editing choices. Also, while I'm not going to really rag on composition, Deathflix suffers from a little something I like to call sky high fever, otherwise known as the overuse of superfluous Dutch angle shots. This is named for the 2005 film Sky High, also known as My Hero Academia before the fuckable frog. I wanna bang you. Well, not quite as bad. Deathflix also appears to have been filmed on a slight incline. Either Seattle Vancouver. is listing into the Pacific Ocean, or these Dutch angle shots are just meant to be quirky, off kilter. Am I supposed to feel disconcerted about this guy exiting a school bus? Also, giving Zack Snyder a run for his money with the slow-mo here, Wingard. The first minute and a half of your movie is almost all slowed down. Trust me, bud, you do not have the time to be doing this. I'm being too nitpicky. I'll stick to story. We meet our protagonist, Light Yagami. Sorry, Turner. Light, relax, Light. I know that you're Light Turner. I get it. Light Turner. Thanks! Like in the manga, he's a high school student and will become Kira, god of the new world. And that's about where the similarities end. Contrasted with the original light, handsome, popular, with non-dyed hair, wore a uniform, and always clean cut and presentable, this light is a dirty Michelin twink who surprised a girl would even give him a moment's notice. Leave the book in her general direction again. We do see Lightling fill out a math sheet like it's nothing, establishing that this version of Light is also hecka bright. Hey! But the movie will cunningly subvert this by making him actually retarded. I wanna pause on this moment because here's where I already knew the characterization of Light was off. Here's Lightling selling the filled out homework to appear to show he's smart and junk. But what else does it say about him? That he's willing to compromise the school system for petty cash. The OG Light would never stoop to this. Light would sooner write test cheaters names in the death note before he ever contributed to the cheating itself. So this Light's out. Um, killing them. And then we have Mia Sutton, whom the movie tries way too hard to establish as being above it all, literally. Friendly reminder that all female smokers will be written up on the day of the note. Mia is supposed to be the Misa Amane character from the manga. Misa was a model, actress, hardcore Kira supporter, and best footstool. I already told you, I don't care even if all you do is use me. And if I become a burden to you, then you can just kill me, okay? After Light killed her parents' murderer, she tracked Kira down and willingly became his pawn, literally giving him half of her remaining lifespan so that she could be useful to him, i.e. the perfect woman. You're seriously gonna date other girls? Yeah, more or less. I don't want you to! <laughs> if I see you with another girl, I'll kill her. Scary. Mia, however, looks nothing like Misa, acts nothing like her, and she's got no hips. To the movie's credit, Mia is, like Misa Amane, the most idiotic character of the cast, although the position is hard fucking one. For Deathflix, Misa is turned into Chloe Price. I'm not even kidding. Mia is Chloe from Life is Tumblr. She's a stuck up bitch, is too cool for school, and pretends to love a vulnerable little boy to use and abuse his supernatural power. Use and abuse your power. Also has a propensity for dying in slow motion. In summary, they took a wifeable yandere and made her into a cuntosaurus mess. Nothing wrong with that, it's new! After Lightling looks confused over receiving an iota of female attention, we get the title card with rainbow lighting, which is obviously a reference to light I'm a gay. Very clever, Deathflix. Very clever. Deathflix should have begun exactly here. About two minutes so far have been wasted. Whoop! Anime comparison time! In the first two minutes of the anime, we're introduced to both Ryuk, the Shinigami from whom the Death Note originates, and Light, the Japanese honor student. We're given an economical rundown of both characters' personalities and outlooks, culminating in this dual dialogue. This world is rotten. Mwah. You get everything you need in a little over two minutes. The Death Note manga and anime have some of the most beautifully efficient openings in their respective mediums. And I apologize that I'm gushing, but god damn, I love everything about it. Deathflix clearly couldn't live up to that, and really, it didn't even bother to. The whole reason to do it was to try and do something completely new and unique. In the first two minutes, we get that Lightling's good at math, is a small-time delinquent, and likes a girl. And the girl's probably a hoe. Completely new and unique. None of that's really worth our time. Just drop the notebook like the Jap live action movie did and let's get on with it.
Oh, they couldn't even drop the death note right. Anime comparison time. Ryuk didn't drop the death note at Light's feet. He dropped it to Earth and let it land wherever because he wanted to see what would happen. And it just happened to land in a school courtyard on a tiny island nation where a bored young man just happened to see its descent. Yes, a radically minded genius just happening upon a magic super weapon because a god was bored that day is coincidental. But that was the point of the premise. Of all the people to stumble onto the death note, it had to be this crazy bastard. It was as if these characters existed to scratch each other's backs in a sort of cosmic quid pro quo. Death Note's setup had a real sense of destiny to it, and it just worked. Meanwhile, well gee Fleuk, if you want him to have it so badly, why not hand deliver it to the guy? Well that's just fucking great! The act of dropping the Death Note at Lightning's feet, while seemingly a small and ordinary change, has large ramifications. It's a gesture that Fluke chose Lightning, a change which is confirmed shortly later. In point of fact, Fluke chose him to separate the wheat from the chaff. But why would a Death God choose a wimpy high school boy to perform this task? Why wouldn't he hand off the Death Note to someone, I don't know, like Light? Hell, why wouldn't he hand it off to Mia? I don't like this one, Light. She has wonderful ideas. The uninitiated viewer is led to believe that there is a purpose behind this act. But by the end, it's all too apparent that Fleuk gives no two fucks about righteous judgment or lightling. And don't tell me Fleuk was just lying the whole time so he could get his rocks off at pushing some stupid schmuck to go on a murder spree. I wish that were the case. What this really is, at least partly, is an attempt, emphasis on attempt, to expedite the story by combining Light's first kill and Ryuk's introduction into a single scene, which essentially comes down to Fluke pushing Lightling to use the Death Note. I think you might be capable of great things. And then they almost immediately forget about it, as the rest of their story has nothing to do with Fluke choosing Lightling. This is painfully amateurish writing, and sadly, it's one of the lesser offenses. It only gets much worse from here. Suddenly, rain. Which kinda sets a good mood, though I don't know why everyone in Seattle's so shocked by it. Lightling picks up the death note, then runs for shelter and right into an extremely well-timed random event. Big guys, straight out of the Back to the Future school of bullying, are giving Four Eyes here a rough time. But Mia, having more balls than Lightling, saves the day. <laughs> not really, she's a girl. Lightling white knights for her, but unable to kill his opponent with pure cringe. That would make you over 18, which means that if you were to beat me up, which I'm sure you could, it would technically be child abuse. He gets his lights. A teacher finds him sprawled out on the ground along with his illegal math sheets. Busted. Literally. Except he just shakes it off to go be lectured by the school principal. Hmm, okay, Mr. Screenwriter, just want you to know, if you're hitting the head so hard that your vision goes blurry and you even pass out, it's not especially normal to be totally fine like an hour later with just an ice pack for your face. But whatever, this is a relatively minor infraction. Lightling pleads with his principal to ignore the illegal homework and go after the people that make things harder on everyone else. like. So what you're saying is bullies function as a sort of social watchdog. Exactly. But well, we found that bullies tend to sniff out the trouble or stupid stupid. I mean, you've seen all these school shooters, pathetic beta males who have no girlfriend. You have the chance to stop the type of people who make things hard for everybody. So why should you get off the hook, Lightling? Because you make doing homework easier for everyone else? Again, making Lightling a baby delinquent is such a terrible narrative decision. Part of why Light's God Complex worked so well was because he crowned the social totem pole. He was a top student in his country, alongside being a model citizen and being the son of a police chief. He could regard himself as righteous because, well, he was righteous, at least to everybody around him. And that was thanks to his own hard work work, principles, and intelligence. It made a twisted sort of sense that Light would consider himself the ultimate solution to the world's ills. Lightling, however, is at the bottom of the social totem pole. His school principal treats him like shit, so we can infer Lightling's no top student nor any model citizen. And he's a bit dim, considering he's ended up in this situation at all. His only claim to righteousness is stepping in to help a girl from a bully, after failing to help the original bully victim so that she had to put herself in the line of fire. Yeah, what a hero. 
Zero. So of course, Lightly makes an appeal to Authority to show the audience that Authority can't be relied upon, and that he'll have to take matters into his own ill-equipped hands. You gotta see the big picture here. I can't take him at all seriously. No one could possibly expect or root for this guy to win. Not to mention his crying is just to set up this embarrassingly forced exposition about Mama Gami. Some people might look at you, a kid in your situation losing your mom the way you did, and they'd be willing to cut you a little slack when it comes to these kind of behavioral issues. There were six writers for this movie, and this is the result. Oh, it's not that bad, ER. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Light's mom was alive and well in the manga, by the way. But a new, yet extremely predictable, direction awaits. Lightling is sent to detention, instead of to the nurse to make sure he doesn't have a serious brain injury. It would explain Lightling's actions for the rest of the movie almost perfectly. Yeah, fucking- So anyway, he's left alone to crack open the death note and read the rules. But then the ghost squad rolls up. Cue stereotypical schlocky horror shenanigans. Power goes out. Random shit's knocked over. Objects start flying around the room like a cyclone's gone off. Lightning screams like a little girl, summing up perfectly the entirety of this film. All this is to introduce our next pivotal character, the Death God, Fleyuk. Also, just to show how much of an autistic fanboy I am, Fleyuk wouldn't leave an apple core lying around like this. He swallowed that shit whole. What's the best way to describe these? You see? Okay. Relax, Light. You're asleep. You're asleep and you're dreaming of some eight foot tall demon looking motherfucker. Oh, yes. I'm telling you, that punch knocked his head meat a little loose. Is Fluyuk just a hallucination of Lightling's addled mind? It's all in your mind, so why not enjoy it? Is Lightling already dead? Get on this, film theorists. Just watch me, theorists. No one would say or do this. Light Yagami especially. Here was his reaction to meeting a death god. <laughs> No reason to act surprised. I am the Shinigami Ryuk. Well, I'm not surprised. In fact, Ryuk, I've been waiting for you. Oh? Versus... You're asleep. You're asleep and you're dreaming of some eight foot tall demon looking motherfucker. Fuck the alt light. That aside, Defoe is great in this role in terms of voice, and I'll give the movie props for that. I prefer Ryuk's English dub voice by Brian Drummond. Judging by your laughter, you've already figured out that what you have is no ordinary notebook. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's saucy. But still, Defoe is an excellent choice. It's a shame they had to butcher his character so hard that I couldn't appreciate it. You, me, we're exceptional. I could squash you like a bug right now, but I'm offering you a choice. Join me. Imagine what we could accomplish together. What we could create. Cause the deaths of Countless innocents. The Grey Goblin leads Lightling to the window just in time to see Biff and his bud bullying some damsel in distress. Like a devil with his hand on the humans signing the soul contract, Fluke eggs Lightling on to use the Death Note on Biff to help, help her. This is so antithetical to Death Note, I don't know where to fucking start. Since when did Light need to be sweet talked into using the Death Note? When OG Ryuk showed up in Light's bedroom, Light had not only tested the notebook twice before already, he had gotten straight to work writing hundreds of names in it exhausting the world's list of major criminals in five days, surprising even the death god. Ryuk didn't need to push him to help a bullied girl or any weak shit like that. There was only the arbiter of justice telling a god that he planned to remake the world in his own image. I want the world to know of my existence, that there's someone out there passing righteous judgment on the wicked. But here, he's just. So Lightling does as instructed and gives Biff the final destination treatment. 
I have to assume Fluke plucked Biff's skull right out of his head before the ladder hit, because it's not there when it does. Even Lightling seems to be shocked that a human skull could be instantly pulverized by a ladder accelerating from school zone speeds. <laughs> This scene continues to be as not Death Note as it gets, but I'll do comparisons in a moment. Real quick, let's pretend you haven't seen Death Note, and you're extrapolating Lightling's character from this scene alone. At first, you might assume Lightling did as told because, well, who's going to refuse an eight foot tall? Demon looking motherfucker. When he's handing you the pen. Or you might assume Lightling genuinely wants to help the girl. Or maybe he wants revenge on Biff. A combo of all three, perhaps. But the part where he's pushed into writing a cause of death tends the most toward the revenge explanation. He writes decapitation, for God's sake. Sure, he's already committing murder, so might as well go all in. But this is a tad over the top, particularly for a first kill. He saved the girl from bullying, only to give her PTSD triggers. Jesus Christ. Christ. All right, now let's contrast this with the anime. Light did not meet Ryuk at school. He took the Death Note home to peruse its contents. After he read some of the rules, he was naturally skeptical, but he caught the news reporting live on a violent loon holding women and children hostage in a daycare center. Having read that the victim whose name is written in the Death Note will die of a heart attack after 40 seconds if the cause of death isn't specified, well, Light decided to put this lucky contestant through a trial run without really believing anything would come of it. But something did. I repeat, the suspect is now dead. Dead. So to recap, Light's first kill was entirely impersonal, all of his own volition, experimental, not coerced, not gory, not vengeful, and it was to stop an actual criminal, not a schoolyard bully. Amazingly, crazed god Light comes off as way more sympathetic than Combine Kid decapitating his bully and spilling his brains and neck blood all over some girl who will need therapy for the rest of her sorry life. Deathflix couldn't even play its sympathy card right. And let's be honest here, they obviously tried. As sadistic as this scene incidentally comes off, the intention to make Lightling more of a victim of circumstance rather than the instigator is self-evident. The movie then tries to take even more of the blame off of Lightling by making it seem like Fluke is using him to separate, separate the, the wheat, wheat from, from the, the chaff. chaff. But why does Fluke need to do that? Why does he care about removing bad people? Will the movie answer any of these questions or pretend they don't exist? I think you know the answer. This is seriously like watching an Opposites Day version of Death Note. Because they took Light's motivations out of Lightling, Deathflix needs Fluyuk to choose Lightling and push him to do light-like things. Otherwise, there's just no story. Speaking of sloppy... I don't think you're getting out of detention, bub. Next scene is Lightling at home eating dinner with his police chief father, James Turner. After some dialogue about Biff's accident, James criticizes the movie's script for making Light a filthy cheat enabler. That wasn't a big deal. I actually just wrote a couple papers and got detention. You don't think cheating's a big deal? That who you are? It damn well shouldn't be. Light flips his shit over nothing so that mom's tragic fate in a car accident can be exposited some more. It's really bad. If I was a cop and some guy ran over my wife, I'd be pretty pissed off if his dad paid his way out of jail. He killed my mom. That's enough. <laughs> Look, darling, you and I know you used to be one of the best agents in the FBI, but now you're my fiance, Naomi. We talked about this. You just sit there. You just sit there saying the same bullshit about what? how people better just I'm gonna trust assume your age. You're still and just pretty raw your... by what you saw today. It's... Then we're off to the next scene, but wait a minute. Is James uh, not going to bring up? This? You'd think they'd have informed James of the vandalism before getting around to Lightling's extra homework sheets. Instead, uh, this never happened. Movie magic. Lightling goes up to his room to flick through the death note, and he comes upon a warning written by a previous owner to not trust Fluke. Alright, another new direction. Fluke starts expositing rules of the death note that'll be relevant to Deathflix's plot. Rule 20. A subject can be influenced for no more than two days leading up to his death. This takes the 23-day rule from the manga and pairs it down to two days, basically so that Lightling can fuck up the timing and accidentally kill someone to forward the plot. It's dumb, so dumb. But it's nowhere near the dumbest part about that. We'll get to it when we get to it. Two days, your fingers are huge. That was the gayest thing you possibly could have said. Rule 28. 
Each death must be physically possible, so no shark attacks while someone's on the toilet. Okay. Deathflix is trying to ape a rule from the manga here, but does so erroneously. There, the closest rule read, the conditions for death will not be realized unless it is physically possible for that human, or it is reasonably assumed to be carried out by that human. The conditions, my friends. The conditions for death must be physically possible. You might say that's splitting hairs. I say that's being precise. precise. The autism of the Death Note rules was and is absolutely needed for its story to work. All you had to do was copy the fucking rule. And for now, we'll just ignore the omission of the whole second part of the manga rule, turning the American Death Note into an all-powerful Gias. That's too much to delve into right at this bit. We'll get to it when we get to it. Oh, and by the way, in Deathflix, physically possible includes hardcore telekinesis. Just keep that in mind. Lightling asks if he was chosen to be the notebook's owner. Who gave it to me? I mean, did you give it to me? The last keeper of the note passed away. It fell to me to find a new one. So, yes. Okay. So Fluk is not really the keeper of the Death Note. He is the keeper of the duty of finding humans to keep it, which he's compelled to carry out for some reason never given. Why make this change from the manga? For what benefit or purpose? Spoiler! It's for the red hair! It's also to remove autonomy from Fluke since his character's been so bastardized already that hell, why not? It's strongly indicated all over the place that Fluke himself can't use the Death Note. Therefore, he must find a Keeper to do so, for reasons again never given. The Death Note acts as a sort of interface between the Keeper and Fluke himself. The Keeper writes instructions in the book, and Fluke carries them out. Naturally, in the manga, it was the opposite. The Shinigami were completely autonomous. They were Reapers. But instead of wielding scythes, or just scythes, they wielded death notes. Their pseudo-immortality came from adding the remaining lifespans of those they killed to their own, if and when they ever felt asked to. Humans, for the most part, were little more than insects to them, and getting involved with one was seen as just plain weird, much less letting one keep their death note. The death notes did not control the Shinigami in any way, instead acting as symbiotic tools that operated independently from the death gods. All of that was apparently too complicated for an American audience. Cowboy, understand. Lightling finally asks a pertinent question. I wrote those warnings about you in the margins. Oh, is that what we're gonna do with the note light? Rules and warnings? Yes, Fluyuk. We're going to discuss the warnings because it seems like you might have raped the previous keeper. Rules and warnings? Oh, we're not? Oh. Lightling also neglects to ask if writing in the Death Note comes with any terms and conditions. You know, something you ought to ask any devil before you make a pact with them? Light at least acknowledged that writing in the Death Note likely meant his soul was forfeit. I used the notebook even though I knew it belonged to a Shinigami. And now that Shinigami has come. So what'll happen to me? You're here to take my soul, right? The thought doesn't even enter this retard's mind. Post haste, Lightling uses Fluyuk to impale his mother's killer on a steak knife. Presented in trailer format? <laughs> Ultimately, this is another sympathy card play, because Lightling is the real victim, and killing off his mother's killer is only fair. This is super lame compared to anything Light did, but it works a lot better than beheading a schoolyard bully. Skip ahead, and Lightling's in... I guess, gym class? Why is he sitting in the bleachers all by himself? Is this more detention for blowing up his classroom the other day? In any case, this would be the perfect opportunity to show Lightling's high athletic ability, since Light was the Prince of Tennis by day, Kira by night. But wait, 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 how about we just have Lightling sitting around, flipping through the Death Note, in public, in plain view of everyone? What the? Fuck! This is beyond the fucking pale. Who brings their magic weapon of mass destruction to school? What if Chad McThunderjock playing b-ball down there came up to the bleachers and took Lightling's shit because his weak ass posture was asking for it? Why risk it being stolen like that? He's not even trying to obscure the Death Note. Like in a textbook or a magazine or a bag or anything. Okay, Light didn't bring that shit to school. In fact, he was so paranoid of anyone finding the Death Note that he placed a fake bottom in his 
his desk drawer and stored it underneath that. And should it be tampered with, a small plastic casing filled with gasoline would be set off, destroying all evidence of the death note. And he didn't even stop there. He kept and wrote a fake diary to place on top of the fake bottom as a dummy. Light went above and beyond. Lightling on the other side of the bell curve can't even bring a fake book cover to school as he waves his super weapon in everybody's fucking faces. Well, of course, Mia somehow manages to sneak up on Lightling. I know that you're Light Turner. Yeah, I got it. She starts sidling up to him to get the gory details of Biff's death since she's one of them degenerates who schlick themselves to Guru. I just wish I'd seen it. You know, I heard his head spun all the way around. Oh, actually his head exploded into a million pieces. In case you're wondering. You saw it? Mm-hmm. You'll never guess what happens next. Death note? What is it? What is what? Your book? Uh, I can't tell you. Okay. Do you really want to know? Boy, open that book, write your name, die a virgin. Fuck you. I don't need to tell you Light Yagami wouldn't have done this, nor have been this disgustingly desperate for a girl's attention. It was, again, the reversed scenario. Misa was the one obsessed with Light, whereas he couldn't have cared less about her or her well-being. She couldn't even get him to sex her. Hi. <laughs> I'll be a good girl and go to bed by myself, okay? Yeah, good night. Light had to be blackmailed into a pseudo relationship with Misa by another death god. And even then, he only went along with it because Misa was a useful tool for him. Lightling, though, prostrates himself for pussy the moment he gets a whiff of it. Is this supposed to make him more sympathetic? More relatable? Because I think it says more about the writers of this brain cyst than anything else. We might as well out these guys while I'm at it. Death Flicks 2017 was originally written by brothers Charlie and Vlas Perpenides when it was only Death Note 2009 and Vertigo Entertainment was developing it. In 2011, Warner Brothers acquired the rights along with the script and Shane Black was brought on to direct. Shane had screenwriters Anthony Bargarozzi and Chuck Mondry reported restore the script into something more faithful to Death Note, particularly in the case of Light's characterization. Sadly, Shane left the project, and Death Note wound up with Netflix, where the script fell into the hands of Jeremy Slater. It was Jeremy's draft that went into production, with revisions by Kyle Killen, who apparently didn't or couldn't do much to save it. After finishing Death Flix for the first time, I took a gander at Jeremy's Twitter, just to see. It was enlightening. I don't want to get all political on you, but in researching Hollywood writers and directors, I've seen the same person over and over and over and over again. It's hard not to think that Hollywood has a certain mold that only certain people fit into. By extension, there may be a mold most of their characters must fit into as well. Really, what kind of person would take a character like Light, a well-off handsome honor student driven by high concepts like justice and order and his own ego, and decide to make him into a downtrodden wimp guided by base empathic responses? What exactly is their thought process for something like that? Maybe this is just the American obsession with the underdog archetype gone too far, yet the narcissism of the character remains. It's only the self-confidence that has been excised, much to the disapproval of many Americans. Funny how that works. Well, I'm sure it's just a fluke and has nothing to do with any stereotypes about the writers. Modest proposal. Every kind of gun is legal, but only women are allowed to own them. I believe I should control the gun. It's the men who need to be checked. Let's get back to Lightling trying to get into a girl's panties with his death god. He goes as far as showing himself killing a hostage taker on a live stream. Not because the guy needed swift justice dealt unto him, but because Mia is growing more and more uninterested in Lightling by the second. <laughs> And suddenly, love is in the air. Afterward, Lightling shares with Mia his doubts and worries about the Death Note. Do you think that I'm crazy? You're at a real low point in your life when you need a chick you've never spoken to before that day to justify your murders. If anything, I think you're not crazy enough. Yeah, basically everything wrong with this reimagining of light. Thank you, Mia. We could change the world. We? Oh, please tell me this is a god complex finally speaking up. Like we as... As in us. Ah, Death Note, a love story. <laughs> like we as, as in us. <laughs> Fucking Jesus. Most effective jump scare yet. Nearly gave me a heart attack. Lightling sneaks Mia up into his bedroom because apparently he can come home after dark without worrying his father. Couldn't have the caring father trope getting in the way of the script. Then this happens.
Can I kiss you? You're not supposed to ask. What am I supposed to do? More like light turner off. <laughs> Cue a montage of Lightling and Mia cuddling, making out, and having sex as they murder criminals. It's kind of disgusting how cavalier they are about brutally slaughtering hundreds of people while they Netflix and kill. Congrats, Deathflix, on somehow provoking a degree of disgust and revulsion from me that a guy who killed innocents for his god complex did not. But at least Lightling starts talking about godhood in this montage, finally, although it's tempered and gutless. What they want? a god so let's give it to him light didn't want to give anyone anything he wanted the world to bend to his will because in his eyes that was what the world needed so even when lightling talks about being a god it's still from a place of weakness another reimagining hey remember when it was fluke who wanted to kill all the bad people and lightling was kind of just a pawn whatever happened to that where even is fluke anyway hmm kira kira what does that mean? It actually means light in Russian or Celtic. Okay, first of all, choosing a name that connects to your real name is just... Dude. Well, wouldn't you be worried that they could just trace it back to you then? Maybe I was a little hasty to call you the stupidest. Second of all, Kira does not mean light in Russian. And as far as I can tell, it's not even a word in Celtic. No, could they? It also sort of means killer in Japanese. So if they're going to be looking for him, it's going to be on the wrong continent. The idea that Lightling would use the Kira transliteration to trick authorities into thinking he's Japanese... It's okay. It's pretty much the only way to shoehorn the Kira name in there. And I was all right with that. Until a few seconds later, when Lightling has inmates in six different continents write, Lord Kira has returned to punish the wicked in perfect Japanese. Each victim left behind the same message written in perfect Japanese. Hi. Death Note had this rule. In the occasion where the cause of death is possible but the situation is not, only the cause of death will take effect for that victim. If both the cause and the situation are impossible, that victim will die of a heart attack. So for example, say you write the name of a woman and that she will die by being struck by a car. However, there's too much shit in the way for a car to hit her. Because the situation is impossible, and thus the cause of death as well, the woman would die of a heart attack. Deathflix didn't get far enough into reading the rules on the Wikia page, and did include this, thereby fucking everything up. Each victim left behind the same message written in perfect Japanese. So the strong implication is that their writing in Japanese should have been an impossible situation. If that's true, our overdue super detective, L, is basically fucked. Lightling has an entire world's worth of criminals whom he can mind control to do exactly as he wants, with information generated from thin air. We can safely assume that Lightling himself doesn't know Japanese, which means he's not even constrained to transplanting his own knowledge into his victims' brains. Defeating L is as simple as Lightling commanding anyone to sketch a photorealistic depiction of L's face, then to text it to him with L's name. Bam! L's face, his name, and Lightling's phone number magically appear in that person's head. Movie over. Hell, Lightling can send himself L's face and still live to gloat about it. According to a take backsy rule we'll be introduced to later, this shit was covered explicitly in the manga. In fact, this retarded scene is ripping that part of the manga off instead of just adapting it, which makes this oversight even more more inexcusable. Light wrote that different convicts each perform an impossible task. One convict had to draw a portrait of L, but as the convict didn't know L's face, he didn't draw anything and simply died of a heart attack. Another convict had to write a specific message, but as the convict had none of the requisite knowledge to understand or believe said message, he didn't write it and simply died of a heart attack. From these experiments, Light gathered he could only mind control humans within certain boundaries. Without those boundaries, he really would be a god. So it's a good thing the author thought to include them, but it just gets worse in Deathflix. So Mia finds some ISIS leader who's oversissing all suicide operations. All of them. Even his own. But blowing himself up in front of his men? Is Deathflix implying there can be collateral damage? Uh oh. Then Kira has cartel members throw themselves in front of a train, completely derailing it. But aren't those passenger cars? How many innocents did that indirectly kill? This scene is treading the line of another rule from the manga. Two rules, actually. 
which were, even though only one name is written in the death note, if it influences and causes other humans that are not written in it to die, the victim's cause of death will be a heart attack. And, whether the cause of the individual's death is either a suicide or an accident, if the death leads to the death of more than the intended, the person will simply die of a heart attack. This is to ensure that other lives are not influenced. These rules essentially guarantee that the death note can't be cheated to send assassination orders. Otherwise, anyone with a name and a face would be a potential jihadi under Light's command. Now, don't worry, I know I sound like I'm nitpicking here, but this scene is only a harbinger of much more overt rule breaks to come. Just you wait and see. At 30 minutes and 10 seconds in, nearly a third of the way into this fucking movie, we finally, finally meet our deuteragonist, L. Tell me if you can, uh, spot the difference?